Okay, what I'm going to talk to you about um, first, now let me just get this screen working. Um, give me one second, and I'm going to, um, how do I share the screen now? Um, oh, yeah. yeah, the plus is there, it says stop sharing screen. So why does it say stop sharing screen? Mm -hmm. Is the, Are you seeing my screen, Eugenia? Uh, uh, no, I see you, Bill. You see me? Yeah. Okay. That's now, now, now do you see my screen? Not yet. Okay. No, I see, your, I see your screen. Uh, look, let me elaborate on that. Yes, yes, we can see your screen. Yep, go ahead. Right. Okay, excellent. I'm going to talk about the Learning by Design work as professional practice. Um, and one of the things that we've done with, with this Learning by Design environment is we've built it as a web platform. We built it as, and you know, people might have heard the expression Web 2.0. Um, um, web 1.0 was a world where people simply presented information to the world. So this, this page you're seeing here is actually a classic Web 1.0 page because we're telling the world about our Learning by Design work and Learning by Design project. But when I go into the web planner, which I think a lot of you will have used, yep. it's a classic Web 2.0 space because it's a space where people share and it's a, a space where people um, um, create stuff together and they make it available to each other and they publish it. Um, so this is a classic um, Web 2.0 environment and we've been very heavily involved in that. Now one of the interesting phenomena that we've discovered um, along the way, these are learning elements which have all been published in English, um, one of the things that we've discovered along the way is that um, a lot of collaborative work happens. So people know that the traditional um, classrooms, so you can see here all these really interesting learning elements that have been produced by peop um, people. There's one in Greek, which some, someone obviously selected our language as English and it came out in, in, uh, in the, on the Greek side. But you can see here um, uh, that a lot of these pieces of work actually have multiple teachers uh, involved in writing them. So uh, remember that in, um, you know, historically the way teachers operated as professionals is they would go into their classroom and they would close the door. Um, and, um, um, but this, and, and they would teach their lessons from the textbook and from their lesson plans. But the whole point of this learning by design environment as a professional learning environment is that because it's web-based, people can do things together and they can share it in a way that's more readily done and more convenient than ever in the past. And in a way, it's a bit like um, what's happened with the whole of the new media, um, with blogs, uh, with wikis, with social media. People are very actively making their own internet worlds, and instead of just being consumers of content, they're actually producing content as well. So here we have this wonderful resource of many hundreds of really great lessons which have been produced, but what this reflects um, is a very different kind of set of professional practices. Um, so that's in terms of, um, you know, the nature of teachers' work. And it's this interesting issue of um, the nature of teachers' work changing. So in the same way that these Web 2.0 um, uh, tools are changing the media um, and changing the news and changing the way we communicate with each other, um, there's enormous potential to change the way in which teachers uh, design and share curriculum as well. Um, so that's my little intro about the professional learning stuff. What I was going to do is go in now, and I'll go into the Greek version, and um, talk about the way in which learning by design um, helps you um, scaffold the activities that the, that the students do. So with all, I'm going to go into, um, he, I'm now into the Greek side. Can, can you see that all right, folks? Yes. Go Excellent. Ahead. Excellent. Um, and I'm going to go here, and I'm going to just speak to this in English, even though they're the Greek words. Is that clear, um, Eugenia? Yes, that's fine, Bill. So one of the things we do as professionals, as teachers, is we build learning design. So we build activity sequences. So... Um, you know, a classic old-fashioned activity sequence might have been um, get the students to read the chapter, um, have a discussion about it, they can put up their hands and answer questions made by the, um, created by the teacher, get them to write some notes in their book which summarise what's in the textbook, 
and then give them a test, right? That's a classic kind of set of, it's an activity sequence. So what teachers have always done is plan the activity sequences that happen in their classrooms. Now what Learning by Design is about, it's about planning activity sequences. But what it does, um, it wants to, um, um, it, um, it's about conceiving those activity sequences as different types of learner activity, different types of pedagogy, but also different ways of thinking, different ways of, of, of knowing the world. So these um, knowledge processes here, it's a kind of a little classification of these quite different ways of knowing the world. And in terms of professional practice, what it's about is teachers, it's a kind of a checklist to check that all those things are being done. So um, in the green segment, uh, we have, um, you know, one very powerful learning um, form of learning is experiential by immersion in, in doing stuff, right? So, um, or immersion in, um, in, in meanings that have come from the world. And some of those might be things which are from the students' own lives, like tell me about your experience, or bring in a toy that's important to you, or bring in, um, a, tell me something you've read, or tell me something you've seen on television. So bringing in the student's own experience. Now, too often historically with an education context, we've been wanting to tell the students things that are new, and we haven't necessarily been very concerned to connect with what their actual lived worlds are, their actual lives. So one type of experiencing we can do in a classroom is have the students bring in artifacts um, or say things about their actual experience, which is we call experiencing the known. But the other thing we can do is we can immerse students in new things, um, give them a book to look through, show them a video, take them on, a, on an excursion. So we're not actually doing explicit teaching at this point. We're just simply getting absorbing, getting them to absorb meanings. But these always have to be within a sort of what Vygotsky calls the zone of proximal development. They have to be in a space which is intelligible. It might be new, but it can't be too new. So if you were to throw me into um, the third year of a Chinese language course, um, you'd be throwing me into something new, but I wouldn't understand a word of it. I'd be wasting my time. Um, so in other words, it has to be something which is intelligible, even though it is new. The second thing, moving around this circle now to the blue quadrant, is that one of the things we do in schools classically is we name things. We call things triangles or we call things a word and a word is made up of letters um, and shapes. Um, there are all kinds of shapes in the world of which triangles are one shape and squares are another shape. Now the world is actually full of circles and squares and triangles in the real sense. That's the experiential world. But what we do is we actually um, give these things names in our curricula. Um, and there are those two next ideas there, which is um, um, conceptualising by naming. So you actually conceptualise, a build the idea of a square um, by, by naming it and drawing examples of it and, and whatever. But then what we do is we um, conceptualise with theory by putting those together. Like, here's a little theory. Um, uh, triangles, squares and circles are all kinds of shape, right? They're all shapes. So we're actually classifying those concepts and putting them get together into a theory. Um, so moving around the circle now to the red quadrant, um, another type of thing we can do with learners is we can have them think about how things work, how things are connected, right? So, um, you know, and that's to think analytically. So, for example, uh, we might have a jigsaw puzzle where the pieces fit together or we might be able to look at cause and effect in, 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 in science, you know, you, 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 know, you fill up a, a container and when you fill it up it gets heavier or, uh, and so on. Um, but also um, uh, analysing critically is working out the, the reasons for things, the purposes for things. Like, you know, when you see a big picture up in an advertisement, um, the purpose of that picture is very different from the picture in the children's storybook that Mary just showed you. In other words, to think of the reasons for things is to analyse critically. But the other important thing we need to do in schools, which is the, which is the, or in learning, including early childhood learning, which is the yellow quadrant, is we need to um, have students who are, um, concept, uh, who are, sorry, applying what they know 
actually making things, doing things, creating pictures, writing texts, um, um, perhaps making little videos, um, who are actually applying their knowledge to pr um, practical purposes. And that can be just simply applying appropriately, which is doing things the right way, the way you're told to do them, or it can be mixing things up and creating new things and being quite original or quite innovative in what you do. So the reason why we built that little set of things is a way, in terms of the professional learning question that um, that, that um, uh, Eugenia set up at the beginning, um, it's very much, the purpose of that is very much about building a kind of a checklist of the range of activities that our learners are doing which really stretch them. So for example, if we just do experiential all the time, it doesn't really push the kids cognitively. It's a great thing to do because it's related to the real world, but is it pushing them cognitively? If we're just doing um, uh, conceptual stuff though, it may become really boring and not connect with their world. So we actually need to do, or you know, we need to sort of do a mixture of these things and what um, designing, learning design is about, it's about building activity sequences which um, put these different activity types into a coherent kind of whole. So that's, if you like, the, the idea. But, you know, again, getting back to this idea of Web 2.0, it's actually very much not giving teachers things to do, but getting them to be learning designers themselves, active learning designers, and using the web to, to share those ideas. So if you like, they're the main, um, the main, um, the main ideas of um, learning by design. I know you've probably heard them all before um, in one way or another, but I thought there'd be no harm in going through them again, um, but also talking about this question of professional learning and my main my two main lessons are instead of you being somebody who does what someone else tells you to do you as a teacher are in control as designers of the learners activity sequences mm -hmm. and it's a good idea to think of the variety of kinds of activity that your learners are undertaking that's the first lesson the yes. second lesson is with web 2.0 we can do this collaboratively we can share things we can write joint learning uh, these things called learning elements, we can share them, uh, we can use things that other teachers have designed and therefore instead of just waiting for somebody to create the book for us, we're actually creating the book uh, and we're sharing it and we're sharing our professional uh, experience as, as teachers. So that's my little, um, uh, little overview of, the, of these issues. So um, folks there, Eugenia and the rest of the people in the group, is there anything else that You'd like to okay. questions you'd like to ask? Thanks a lot, Bill. Like and I explore? think uh, because you, your time is limited, um, we'll take some questions. If not, we're going to re release you just uh, for you to continue with your day. I have a question. I have a question. I have a question. I have a question. I have a τους στείλουμε μηνύματα, τώρα το έχουμε και σε live streaming, μπορείτε να το ξαναδείτε, και αυτοί θα απαντήσουν αργότερα, αν δεν έχετε κάποια πιεστική ερώτηση τώρα. Κάποιες ερωτήσεις, ή εδώ οι συνάδελφοι, οι φοιτητές. I think, Bill, we have a shy uh, audience, so we're going to release you and probably we're going to post some questions to you uh, okay. via, via email or something. But uh, just for you to, uh, to know, uh, the whole thing is stream, uh, live streaming, we do this live streaming uh, sort of uh, uh, activity for um, other teachers um, who are, uh, you know, across the, um, the region and Greece. So uh, we're going to welcome comments from them as well, and we're going to direct uh, whatever question to you guys. Okay? okay? Later on. Okay, thanks for your time. Really appreciate okay. that. And uh, uh, we'll see Rita tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs>